Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everybody this morning. If you don't know me, my name is April Colquitt. I'm on staff here at Wellspring. I usually serve as our children's pastor. I still am the children's pastor, but sometimes I have the privilege of serving here in this role and um, delivering a message, um, which is what I get to do today. It's a privilege for me to be able to open this God is Love series. I'm so excited for what we're gonna be talking about. Keith and Cedric gave it away just a little bit earlier in our welcome, if you missed it. We're talking about sort of recalibrating our view of God. And I was, as I was thinking about what we're gonna be learning about in the series, um, I thought about the very first time that I ever cooked a turkey. I know, hang with me. If you'll hang out with me for a few minutes, it's gonna make sense, I promise. Um, I, the very first time I ever cooked a turkey was, of course, at Thanksgiving. When else do you eat a turkey? Does anybody cook a turkey when it's not Thanksgiving? Probably not. Um, but I, if I, we were still newlyweds. Eric and I hadn't been married for very long. We lived in Texas at the time, and it was maybe the first time, I think it was the first time, that we were not traveling to see our family in Alabama. We were going to be staying in Texas, and so we had a few family members who were coming to stay with us for Thanksgiving. And so in my newlywed little state, I was like, I am gonna make the perfect Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Mind you, I was still learning how to make food at this point. And so I'd never cooked a turkey, and I went out and bought a huge Thanksgiving turkey. There were only gonna be four adults and mostly toddlers. So I don't know what I thought we were doing with this whole turkey, um, but I went and I researched like how to prepare it so that it would be this juicy, amazing turkey. And I did all the seasonings, prepared it all the right way. And it had one of those poultry timers in it. You know, the little turkey timers. So I was like, great, so easy. This is going to be a piece of cake. Don't even have to think about how long to cook this turkey. Put the turkey in the oven. And the first time I checked on the turkey, the poultry timer had already popped. A little red, it, and I can tell you, it was nowhere near done. I mean, it was not golden on the outside. The juices were not running clear. The turkey was nowhere near ready for us to eat. Problem was, I had no idea how much longer it needed to cook. So I just continued to cook the turkey. I did have a meat thermometer, but I wasn't very confident in that thermometer either because the probe that goes into the meat was actually bent. It was crooked. <laughs> And so I was like, I don't really think that's going to work. And so I just cooked and cooked and cooked this turkey. And when we ate it, um, it was edible. It wasn't charred or anything, but it was so dry that we pretty much had to cake it with dressing and cranberry sauce to choke it down. You know, have you ever had a turkey like that? And I don't know, maybe you have had an experience like that. If you cook very often, you might have had an experience like that with a meat thermometer where you put the thermometer in the meat, in the chicken, and it says that it's done, but then when you slice into it, it's still like questionably pink. It's like, uh, pork is the hardest, by the way. It's hard to know for sure if it's done. Can you really trust your meat thermometer? Your thermostat on your home can be the same way. It says it's 72 degrees, but it feels more like 80 degrees. So either you're having hot flashes or something's wrong with your thermostat. It's hard to know. Bathroom scales, same thing. Have you ever stepped on your bathroom scales? Right? Yes. Oh, that resonates, doesn't it? You're like, well, I mean, that cannot be right. I know I had a cheat day over the weekend, but it wasn't that bad. Something is clearly wrong with the scales. That's the problem. The problem... And the thing about instruments like thermometers and scales is that they are calibrated to a certain standard of measurement. But they're very sensitive instruments. So if they suffer damage or if they get misused or there can be environmental factors like change in altitude, for example, that can affect the accuracy of those instruments. And so what you're really supposed to do is to check their accuracy. You're supposed to recalibrate those on a pretty regular basis to make sure that you're getting accurate readings. So for example, if you wanna recalibrate your meat thermometer, you just stick it in a pot of boiling water. Boil it, water boils at 212 degrees. So if your thermometer only reaches 200 degrees, then you know that it's off by about 12 degrees and you need to adjust your cooking time to that 12 degree difference, right? You don't wanna be eating undercooked meat or turkey that's so dry you gotta choke it down with cranberry sauce. <laughs> Me accurate measurements matter, and we all get that. You get the point. 
You don't want to be walking around thinking you've got to lose 10 pounds when it's really your scale that's the problem. Accurate measurements matter. And the reason that I bring all of that up is because it perfectly illustrates where we're going in this series. Because when it comes to God's love, I can't think of anything more important than having an accurate measure of his character and of his love. We just sang a song a few moments ago about God's love, that he's overwhelming all of our shame, overcoming every grave. God is love, God is love. And we've heard that so many times. We know that God is love is sort of a foundational belief. It's one of the first things I ever learned about God. I grew up in church, and so I grew up learning and knowing that God is love. But regardless of what your experience is with the Christian faith or with going to church, you are probably familiar with this foundational belief of the Christian faith, that God is love. Some of you bring your children to Wellspring Kids because you want them to know God is love. It's one of the very first things that we learn about him, and we've heard it so many times, and we're so familiar with that phrase that we understand that love is one of the most defining qualities of God. If I were to ask you to list some of the qualities of God, I bet you would even list loving as one of them. But the thing about God is love is that it's pretty easy for us to accept and understand when we're kids But as we get older, we have experiences in life and we encounter people that sometimes might begin to affect those foundational beliefs, even the belief that God is love. And so bad things can happen to us or to people that we care about and we start to see all of the corruption and bad things happening in the world or we get let down or rejected time and time and time again and we start to wonder, is God really love? If God is love, who does he really love then? Or maybe you've asked this question, if God is love, then why does he blank? If God is love, then why does he not want me to be friends with certain people anymore? If God is love, why doesn't he care about what's happening in my life? If God is love, why does he let bad things happen to good people? If God is love, Why is he keeping score of everything that I do? If God is love, why blank? You've probably asked some questions. You have your own phrase to fill in this blank. If God is love, then why does he, whatever it is, you struggle to believe about God's love? For some of you, you might have walked away from God because you don't have an answer to this question. Some of you have maybe thought about walking away from God but you haven't yet, you've just thought about it. Maybe you struggle to believe the things of God. You're just here going through the motions of coming to church because someone you care about wants you to be here or they want you to watch online with them. But if you're really honest, deep down, you struggle to believe that God is love because bad things have happened to you or you've seen some things happen to other people or in our world and you just cannot make sense of how God can be love, and I get it. Sometimes life doesn't add up. You know, I've never been a big fan of math. I don't really like math, probably because I'm not that good at it. That's why I became a preschool teacher. (laughs) Because I know that two plus two is four, and two plus two will be four every single time. Whether it is two Boston cream filled donuts and two glazed donuts, it is still going to be four donuts, right? Might also be why you're questioning the bathroom scales. (laughs) Sometimes life does not make sense. People do not make sense. And especially when we are hurting, God doesn't make sense. And that's when we find ourselves questioning the most defining quality about God, his love. But do you know there is someone who never questions God, who never questions the quality of God's love? And that is Satan. We have an enemy who hates our guts. He wants to destroy our lives. And he never questions the quality of God's love. He knows that God's love is completely pure and perfect. And so he wants to stop us 
from believing in God's love and he is so cunning and so crafty that he has taken the most defining quality about God and he has twisted it and distorted it so much that we all have these views about love that we think, well, if that's love and God is love, then I'm good without God. Don't need it. Or we have such a distorted view of what love is because Satan has twisted it and turned it and messed it up so much that we just start to wonder, well, maybe God's not really love at all. And as long as our thermometer on God is reading cold and unloving, Satan doesn't have to worry about destroying our lives because we'll do that on our own by staying our distance, by staying as far away from God as possible, which is exactly what the enemy wants. He does not want us to experience God's love. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. The enemy has twisted your version of love. Remember when I said that instruments like thermometers and scales are affected by things like environmental factors or misuse or damage? It's very similar with our view and our beliefs about God. See, every single one of us have developed some beliefs about God based on our past, based on our families or our parents, how we were brought up, based on our religious experiences or based on culture, our relationships. Every single one of us have developed beliefs about God based on all of those things. And so probably just within this room, just with a few people who are watching online, There are dozens of different views and images that come to our mind when we think about God because not one person here has the exact same story to tell. So I wanna encourage you for just a moment to stop and let's ask ourselves this question. What has shaped your beliefs about God? Who are the people? What are the events? What are the things that you've been a part of or the experiences that you've had? What things have you heard or been told that have shaped your beliefs about God? It's important that we know the answer to this question because what we think about God affects every single part of our life. If you've been coming to Wellspring for very long, if you've been around or watching us online for a while, you might be familiar with this quote that we've talked about before. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. An author and theologian who's very famous, A.W. Tozer wrote this, and we reference it and we point to this quote sometimes because we believe it carries a lot of weight. It makes a lot of sense if you think about it. What we think about God, our beliefs about God impact every single area of our life. It impacts our worldview. It impacts how we see ourselves and our self-worth. What we think about God impacts the decisions that we make and how we live out our purpose or what we think our purpose might be. What we think about God impacts how we see other people and how we respond and care for other people. It impacts every single thing about us. So for just a minute, let's think what has shaped our personal beliefs about God. And then think about this. Are you sure those beliefs are accurate? Is there a chance that like a thermometer, your beliefs about God have been poorly shaped based on your past experiences or something you've been told or some way that you were treated or some way that you were brought up, is it possible that your thermometer on God, your view of God needs recalibrating to be a more accurate view of his true character? If you will allow me to for the next few minutes, that's where we're gonna start today. We're gonna begin this series today by trying to reshape and recalibrate our view of God and of his character so that we have a better understanding of who he truly is because it impacts every other thing about our lives. And the thing is, we don't have to wonder if our view of God is accurate. 
we can know for sure because we've been given a standard to measure our beliefs about God against. And that standard is Jesus. Jesus is the standard. If we know Jesus, we know everything we need to know about God. We can look to Jesus to know what God thinks, what he's like, what he feels, how he behaves. We just look to Jesus. And here's the thing about Jesus. People love Jesus. Everybody is pretty much okay with Jesus. Actually, 92% of people believe that Jesus was a real person. 80% of people believe that Jesus was a great spiritual leader. We understand that Jesus was a man who felt things, who got hungry, who slept, who felt um, pain, who felt joy, who laughed. He was a real person who walked and ran and swam in the ocean. We get that about Jesus. We understand that as a spiritual leader, he was wise. He was compassionate, merciful, forgiving, kind, peace-loving. We know all of those things about Jesus and it makes sense because we actually have accurate historical documents that we base those beliefs on. We have the gospels, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four gospels are accurate historical biographies of the life of Jesus written by four different men. Matthew and John were two of Jesus' disciples. So they spent the three years of his public ministry going with him everywhere he went and they wrote everything that they saw and heard Jesus say. Mark was not a disciple, but he was a close friend of one of the disciples named Peter. And so he likely spent a lot of time around Jesus and then Peter sourced him with everything else he needed to know. And then Luke was a historian who collected interviews from eyewitnesses to the life of Jesus' ministry. We have those four gospels, those biographies that tell us everything we need to know about Jesus. That is what we base all we know about him on is those four books and then a few other books of the New Testament that are written by a few other guys, Peter, James, John, several others. And all of those New Testament books are aligned with what we read in those four biographies. And so it makes sense that it's easy for us to relate to and understand Jesus because we have those books that teach us about him. And so I wanna go today to one of those biographies because here's the thing about each of those four gospels. They don't just tell us, those men don't just tell us what they thought about Jesus. They tell us things that Jesus said about himself. And the thing that set Jesus apart from everybody else was that he didn't just claim to be a prophet or a teacher. He said he was the son of God. So I wanna go to John's biography. We're gonna look at chapter 14. If you wanna follow along with me in your YouVersion or your Bible app, um, we're gonna be in John chapter 14. And on this one, this is just one of the many occasions where Jesus makes these divine claims about himself as being the son of God. And In John chapter 14, it's about the middle of the book, but chronologically, it's near the end of Jesus' ministry. He's already um, predicted his death and resurrection. He's already had the Last Supper with his disciples, and he's still teaching them about who God is and what he has planned for those who follow follow him. And he says, I'm gonna be going away to prepare a place for you, and then you're gonna come and join me. This is what he's telling the disciples in John chapter 14. And then he says this, Jesus says, and you know the way to where I'm going. You know the way to where I am going. Now, the disciples are a little bit confused because the fact is they don't know the way to where he's going. Have you ever had someone try to give you instructions or directions for how to get somewhere? Like they're trying to tell you how to meet them at a restaurant or how to get to their house and they're like naming streets or landmarks that they just assume you're gonna know. What do you do? You just sort of nod and like, oh yeah, I know exactly where that is. 50% of the time, I have no idea what they're talking about. But I'm probably gonna nod, around, nod along like, oh yeah, I know where that is. In my brain, that's what the disciples are doing. Jesus is saying, you know the way to where I'm going. And they're like, uh-huh. Except for one of them, Thomas. He was like, no, actually we don't. He says this. Thomas speaks up on behalf of the whole group and he says, no, we don't know, Lord. Thomas said, we have no idea where you are going, 
So how can we know the way? I don't know if the disciples were elbowing him or like rolling their eyes like, stop. Just pretend we know what he's talking about. We'll figure it out later. But Thomas is like, Jesus, we're gonna need more information. We don't know what in the world you're talking about. Where are you going? And Jesus answers with a remarkable statement. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. He says, I am the way. I am the way. Now, I grew up understanding this to be a directional statement. No one can come to the Father except through me. We hear that and we think Jesus is giving a direction, meaning if you wanna get to God, you have to come through. I am the pathway, right? I am the bridge to get to God. But it's actually so much more than that. Jesus is declaring that he is God. He's saying, I am the way to understanding God. I am the way to relate to God. I am the truth about who God is. Everything you know to be true about me is true of God. But the disciples are still a little bit confused. Here's what he says next. He says, if you had really known me, you would know who my father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. What does he mean, if you had really known me, you would know who my father is? To really understand and sink our teeth into what Jesus is meaning, I wanna step out of this story for just a minute and let's ask the question, what has shaped the disciples' beliefs about God? What ideas and what stories have shaped everything that they knew about God? And the answer is the stories of their ancestors, the Israelites. That is what they based their belief on about God. That is, for us, the stories of the Old Testament, the stories of Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Esau and Ruth and all of those characters, Daniel and David, that we know from the Old Testament. And some of those stories are incredible stories that paint a supernatural picture of God's power and teach us about his faithfulness. But can we be honest? Some of those Old Testament stories are a little intimidating, (laughs) Because they paint a picture of God as angry and jealous and unrelenting. That is what shaped the disciples' beliefs about God. And here is Jesus saying, I'm God. And they're looking at Jesus and they're like, you're not like the God we've always heard about. You're different. And Jesus says, if you had, you didn't know me then. It's okay because you didn't know me back then. But now you do know me. He says, so from now on, you do know him. You do know God now. You do know what you need to know about him now because you know me. You know God because you know me. And one of the other disciples speaks up. This time it's Philip. And he says, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. He's like, come on. This is not making any sense. Can you just one more time, where is God? Point us in the right direction and we'll figure it out. They are just not getting it. They think there's missing something. There must be more to the story. Show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. Have you ever been in a store and you are talking to a salesperson and they're trying so hard to help you, but there's still some unresolved issue and you say, can you just get the manager Can I speak to the person who's actually in charge here? When I was growing up, my mom stayed at home with us. She worked from home, and my dad worked outside the home at his office. And um, so when we were at home during the summer months or after school, my mom was the one who was there. So if we did something wrong, we got in trouble, we broke something, we did something we weren't supposed to do, she handled it. But she would always say, we're going to talk about this again when your dad gets home which told us, dad's the one that's really in charge. He has the final say, and he's gonna make the final punishment on this issue. And I wonder if that is how we think about Jesus. If we think of him as this junior version of God, as the substitute or the fill-in of God, He's, he's this nice, merciful, kind version of God, but there must be something more that we're missing that seems to be what the disciples thought. 
because Jesus is standing here in front of them saying, I am God. If you know me, you know God, and they're still not getting it. Here's what happens next. Jesus replied to Philip by saying, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't know who I am? Have I been with you all this time? He's like, you guys have been with me every day for the last three years. I mean, he must have been a little bit hurt. He was human. He's been with them for three years and they still, everything they've seen him do, all the miracles, all the things they've heard him teach about, and they still don't fully understand it or comprehend it. And Jesus says one more time, let me clarify, anyone who has seen me, has seen the Father. He is boldly proclaiming, I am God. Everything you have seen me do, everything you have heard me say has revealed God to you. Now what that means for us is that we don't have to wonder what God is like. We don't have to wonder what he thinks. We don't have to wonder what he feels. We don't have to wonder how he behaves or what his love is like. We can just look to Jesus because everything Jesus said, everything he did, every way that he behaved revealed God to us. If we know Jesus, we know God. If, our, if we question our thermometer on God, we just look to Jesus. We don't have to wonder if our, act, if our view of him is accurate. We know the answer. The answer is Jesus. What comes into our mind when we think about God should be nothing other than Jesus. If what we think of God doesn't match the behaviors of Jesus, then we should change our beliefs about God because Jesus perfectly and completely reveals everything we need to know about God. He is the standard on which we base every belief of God. We don't have to look anywhere else. He's it. If we want to know what God thinks about us, if we make mistakes and we mess up, we can look to Jesus. If we want to know how God reacts to our doubts, we can look to Jesus. If we want to know how God feels when we are heartbroken, we can look to Jesus. If we wanna know how he feels about the pain and the destruction that we see in our world, we can look to Jesus. We don't have to wonder what God is like because we have a perfect and complete image of God in Jesus. He is the standard by which we measure everything else. And so if anything that comes into our mind doesn't look like Jesus and sound like Jesus when we think of God, then we just change our beliefs to match the behaviors of Jesus. He's it. And there will be lots of things, as we said earlier, that try to shape our beliefs about God. One of the writers of the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, he writes about some of the things that trip us up, that impact our view and our belief of God. Primarily sin. Sin impacts every single one of our lives. We are all infected with sin and we're impacted by our own sin. We're impacted by the sins of other people. Our beliefs about God are shaped by the thoughts and the patterns of other people. We're impacted by challenges and obstacles that we experience every single day in the world. And all of those things can shape our beliefs and our view of who God is and what he is like. But there is a better way. And the writer of Hebrews tells us exactly how we can recalibrate our thoughts and our beliefs so that all of those other things don't trip us up. This is what the writer of Hebrews says. We do this, we do this, by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Some versions of this verse say the author who initiates and perfects our faith. The story of our faith begins and ends with Jesus. We wouldn't be here right now in this place of worship if it weren't for Jesus. 
we wouldn't be here having a conversation about our thoughts and our beliefs of God if it weren't for Jesus. The Christian faith wouldn't exist if it weren't for Jesus. It is because of his death and his resurrection, the fact that he defeated death, that we are even here talking about these things. It begins and ends with Jesus. God loved us so fiercely and so desperately wanted to connect with us that he gave us Jesus to reveal his true character so that we don't have to wonder what he's like or who he is or how he loves. He gave us Jesus to answer that question for him so that we know exactly who he is and Jesus initiates our faith and he perfects it. Satan wants to destroy it. He wants to twist it and distort it so that we have some messed up views of God because he does not want us to experience the perfect, pure love of God. But the writer of Hebrews says, do not let any of those other things reshape or distort your view of God. We keep going back to Jesus, keeping our eyes on Jesus again and again and again, recalibrating our thoughts to him so that we have an accurate view of who God is. That is how we know him. I know for some of you, you may have walked away from God because of something Jesus did, which I probably don't agree with, I don't agree with, but I can respect it if it's because something Jesus did that you don't like, I get that. But if you've walked away from God because of something that someone else did or because of something you heard or someone said about God, then I would highly encourage you to investigate the person of Jesus. Measure what you have been told about God or what you thought about God against the behaviors of Jesus and see if they match. If they don't, then those beliefs are wrong. And recalibrating your beliefs could free you from a lot of other distorted views about God. But for some of you, this is much more complicated because you've thought about walking away from God or you have walked away from the things of faith because of something that someone did in the name of Jesus. And that hurts deeply. And I understand that. But just because someone else did it in the name of Jesus does not mean that Jesus would do it. It doesn't mean that's what Jesus did. And you don't have to wonder, you can know for yourself. If it's not something that Jesus did or it's not something that Jesus spoke against, then that person was wrong. And we don't have to hold the behaviors of people against God. Because as our pastor Trey says, it's he, not we, that is the standard. It's Jesus, not us, that is the standard for how to live. Jesus is the standard. He is what we measure against. He is the way. He is the truth about God. He is the giver of life. So we don't have to hold the behaviors of people and something that someone else might have done against our relationship with God and keep a distance between us and Him. Just look to Jesus. He is the way, He is the truth. If your thoughts and your beliefs about God are that He is cold and unfair, that he's vindictive and judgmental, that he doesn't care about you or he doesn't want you to have fun and enjoy your life, then I don't blame you for not wanting to follow God. But I wanna respectfully tell you that that is not at all who God is. That is not his character. And I know that because I know Jesus. And that's not who Jesus is. God loves you. His love is so pure and so perfect but we cannot know God unless we know his son, Jesus. That is how we know him because as we said, Jesus perfectly and completely reveals everything we need to know about God. He is the standard. And so for the next few weeks, we're just gonna assume that what A.W. Tozer says is true that what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And so we 
want to be sure, absolutely sure that our beliefs are accurate because it can change everything about who we are and how we live our life. It can make us better friends. It can make us better spouses. It can make us better parents. It can make us better neighbors. When we have an accurate view of God's love, we can be better ambassadors of God's love. And that happens when we know Jesus, when He is the standard, when we recalibrate our thoughts to Him. And so as we head out and we go throughout this week, I wanna challenge you to think about that question that we asked earlier. What has shaped your beliefs about God? Think about that this week. Who are the people? What are the experiences? What are the stories you've heard? What are the things you've been told that has shaped what you believe about God? And ask yourself, do I really believe that that's true of God? Dig into it. And if you find that what you believe of God is not true, it's okay because you can recalibrate your thoughts to Jesus. Do you know that I still have a meat thermometer that is bent? (laughs) Still have it. But I know that it works now because I have tested it to the point of boiling water and it's accurate. And so I cook with confidence, even though my meat thermometer is bent because I know it's correct. Your view or your beliefs of God might be a little distorted right now but you can recalibrate them to Jesus and it can change the way that you live your life every single day. Because when we fully understand and have an accurate picture of God's love, it changes everything about how we live and about how we love other people and how we receive God's love. And so that's what we're gonna seek to do in this series. I hope that you will come back because we're gonna continue to unpack this together with Trey. And we are gonna recalibrate our view of God to have an accurate view of his true character. And it is none other than Jesus. Let's pray. Oh God, we just thank you so much for sending us your son, Jesus, who perfectly and completely reveals everything we need to know about you. Thank you that we don't have to wonder about who you are and who you love and how you love and what you do and what you think and what you feel because we have your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus who is the truth about who you are. And I pray that you would help us to look inward at our own hearts and our own beliefs and that we would ask ourselves, what has really shaped our beliefs? Would you reveal it to us? Would you show us Jesus? And would you begin to correct and recalibrate our thoughts to a better view of your love, to a clearer picture of who you truly are. Thank you for just not hiding yourself from us. Thank you that you do not keep yourself hidden, but you make yourself known. I pray that we would see you and that we would know you purely and simply for who you are. It's in your son's name that we pray, amen.